Um, and we were talking about that the other day that, you know, I've always said, I never said I wanted to commentate. I like, I love my sport, and I've always wanted to give back to my sport. You know, I went away, raised my daughters, you know, my daughters are like on their own, self-sufficient now. So I was like, okay, you know, what can I do? And I do see a need. I was just called in to do this. I mean, I think that's just, you know, I believe in destiny. Everything happens for a reason. And so uh, somebody asked me, they're like, so how many other things have you... They were like, I said, this is my first champion. They were like, oh, they just threw you in. I said, into the ocean. I said, but I've got great coaches. I've got great people helping me out. And uh, it's been fun. You know, it's, it's a, and I'm not telling you what you already see. I'm telling you basically like the mindset of an, of an athlete. You know, my experience from my nine world championships or my five Olympic games, you know, what does it take as a young athlete, middle or seasoned athlete to get here? And, um, I want the audience to be more in tune and aware of what these athletes, the sacrifices that they've had to go through. You know, I keep saying what I really want. My, my ultimate goal is for them to, they can get all the footage from me, but they send me around the world to hang out with different athletes so that you guys see the my, you know, you, oh, you understand what they go through. Yeah, you see their performances. And, and, you know, everybody knows in the back of their mind that, okay, the unsung heroes are those who, you know, their coaches, their support team. But what is a day like for them? What do they have to do? Some of them have kids. Some of them have regular jobs because it doesn't allow, they're not at that point yet that it allows for them to be, uh, you know, just an athlete. So they've got to go to a regular job. Then they, you know, so there's so much that I think as fans, if we knew their story other than a 15 second interview that you might get off the track or a press conference where they may not want to go in and tell you their secrets or whatever, but you know, you, you spend a day with them, you'll get to understand them as athletes, understand they're just like you, they just, sometimes they have more to do, you know, um, and I think it would resonate and connect with a lot of fans where, you know, everybody has a story. You know, there's some who have come through injury. There's some who've come through illness. There's some who've come through, you know, uh, trauma. You know, a lot of things in their lives, you know, death and just different things that every person has a story. And if we put those out there, you know, we want track and field to be, um, and, and the people in track and field to be household names. How do they become household names if you don't put their names in your house? You know, and so I want to be that person because I would love to interview them from an athlete to an athlete. And, you know, let me hang out with Daniel Stahl or somebody and be like, oh, we're eating again, you guys. Oh, here we go. You know, but just so you get an idea of what's really going on with these athletes and worldwide. And then, you know, we've got for the next, what, seven years, we almost have a, a championship or something every single year minus maybe one. So it's a great time, you know, we're coming off of uncertainty, not just as athletes, but as a nation, as a world, as a whole, you know, where we didn't know, we, not not only did we not know if there was going to be an Olympic Games, we didn't know what we were going to do. You know, you didn't know where your kids, if they were going to be able to go back to school. You didn't know what your future was going to be like, if you were going to have a job, if they were going to allow you. So, so what, what? Athletics, in my opinion, what it does for people is it brings a, it brings the world together. You know, you put aside craziness and you come together. That's why those rings are linked in the first place, you know, and why you see the different colors here for world championships representing, you know, the different nations and, and just, just solidarity and unity as a whole. And so track and field can do that for people and and I always tell you know I I've been voluntold to coach at like the high school level by no standards do I expect that those kids or or maybe one or two may make it to this level but for the most part what these kids are learning from sports it's going to help them in any endeavor they choose to do you know you learn that never give up attitude you learn that you know things don't always go the way you want to you have to be willing to, i always tell you we're going to be like the weather today what does that mean we're going to bend we got to bend you know if the wind blows this way we go that way if something happens we got to change it we go that way no big deal same thing when you come here as as an athlete and having to like you know give your all for something that you work so hard for and it comes down to all that work comes down to a single throw or a block start or a second or, you know, an inch or a millimeter or a meter, you know, what do you do? 
how do you make it the best? So. And so how did you deal with that throw through your career? Like you were you were mentioning, you know, athletes deal with, you know, injuries and sickness and all that and you literally dealt with all of that. How did you, you know, manage to deal with that and still have such a long career um, you know, throughout the eighties and nineties? Right. Well you know what I um I'm that person that I carry sticky notes around and I write my goals down and I actually sign them like I'm signing a contract. And for me it's like word is bond. If I sign it, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to see that that goal is accomplished. And the goals that I write down, I try to make sure that they're realistic goals. So I like pray about it. And um, I, I just assume that anything that comes with that, I got to deal with it. You know, you talked about my illness. Uh, my Graves' disease was one of the toughest things that I've had to deal with. It took them almost three years to diagnose me. I came very close to having my feet amputated. And even I remember laying in the hospital bed saying if they take my feet I'm, I'm still going to the Olympic Games you know Paralympics I got to do what I got to do because I wrote that down and you know one of my favorite books is uh, um, a Dr. Seuss book called Horton Hatches the Egg and as I said what I said I said what I meant and Ellis is faithful 100% and if I can't be faithful to myself I can't be faithful anywhere else so I try to live by that <laughs> and uh, but it gets hard and it got hard during that time. There were times where I felt like the walls were closing in and there was no way out. And I had to figure out how to make it through. You know, and then I was still having issues. I came back and I was, you know, very fortunate to be able to be back on the track. But I was still having some issues and I kept thinking, okay, well this just must be residual effects of what's going on. I got my life. Who am I to complain about my eyes and, and things still being kind of blurry and whatever. And 30 years plus now, I just found out last year I was diagnosed with something called thyroid eye disease, which is 50% of people who have Graves' disease may develop this. I happen to be one of those. <laughs> and, you know, and so that explained all the stuff that I was dealing with. Because I got to the point where I'm like, at nighttime, I don't want to drive at night because the, the you saw I had like 15,000 glass. I tried to put a, a couple of them away and I got drops everywhere. Um, that at nighttime the lights were blinding me and all the the glasses that they say help you at night they don't help me they only magnify and uh, make it obvious that these lights are coming at me so I was I was probably the only parent that was glad when her daughter just got to be age 16 where she could drive you know um, and, and so I'm working you know with a company now called Horizon Therapeutics and I want to educate everybody else. I don't want to, you know, I'm a sprinter. I'm supposed to get to the finish line first, and yet it's taken me 30 years. You know, I did do a half marathon, so I figure I must have gotten that, that, that distance in, uh, mentality now. But it's taken me so long to get this second diagnosis, you know, and finding out that it can't be diagnosed by, you know, my endocrinologist. It had to be an oculoplastic surgeon or a neuro-ophthalmologist, so it had to be somebody in that field. And, you know, I want people to know, you know, my plan is even to talk to Karani when he's done, to let him know. You know, I've talked to him about the grave disease. I don't want to talk to him until afterwards, you know, because I know how hard it is coming back. And I'm so pleased to see that that strength that he's, you know, it takes a lot. And he's running a 400, which is already a booty lock event, you know. And so in addition to having booty lock, you tell me I might have, oh, no, I don't want to hear that. You know, I just want him to compete to the best of his ability, but then just be aware because, you know, there are things that we have to be aware of, other things that people don't have to do that we have to do to make sure that we continue. You know, we t I take medication every day for the rest of my life, and I tell people it's a very small price to pay to have the quality of life that I have, but I got to do what I got to do. Can you talk about the support system that you did have? Because like you said, right, a lot of athletes, you know, from a fan's perspective or media, we see like the training, we see the competition, and we only see the athletes. Sometimes we don't even see the coach, um, right? But So can you talk about the support system you had through your career and also those who helped you um, while you were going through sickness and injuries? You know, support is very important because nobody, I, I always tell people, no one gets to what's considered success by themselves. You know, the difference is not, in my opinion, race, creed, or cover, color is access and opportunity. So it becomes, when you look at, so for, I'll go back to me. So for me in my career, you know, the Olympic Games seem like something that you read about, not something that you actually participate in. You know, world championships, all that kind of stuff. And so reading about Wilma Rudolph. And how that happened was I actually was seventh grade. We had to go into the media center and everybody had to get a book and I didn't want to, it was a lot of kids in our class. So I was like, oh, you know, whatever. 
I was walking by and a book fell off the shelf and I'm like, oh, that's the book I'm getting. I didn't even know what it was. I just checked it out. And then when I got outside waiting, you know, teachers like wait in line. I got outside and I was like, the Wilma Rudolph story. Interesting. Okay, I'll read it because we have to read about it. And I read it, you know, I was so enthralled in reading about her life, you know, one of 22 kids. Oh, and you know, the first thing I went to my the bathroom. Oh my gosh, you know. Um, but knowing that she had polio and that her mom took her every time she had to have treatment from Clarksville to Tennessee, you know, to get the treatment that she needed just to help her child out. Not that she had aspirations of being a trap, but just so that she would fit in. You know, that she could be who she was supposed to be, whoever God deemed, you know, Wilma Rudolph was supposed to be at that time. And I end up reading the book every year. I always tell people I didn't turn it in. I did buy it, but I did not turn it in. And uh, it became just something for me to read, you know, and it wasn't until I got to my senior. I didn't start running, you know, there's kids who run age group. I started running when I was 15, which is considered late. That was my sophomore year in high school. Um, and I started running cross country because my brother made me. He beat me up. Don't beat up your big little your little siblings. But um, and um, I ran cross country, and then track season came around. I was like, I cannot see myself running two miles around this track. That is not going to happen. So I, um, what I ended up doing was, I was like, okay, I'll run half. You know, I'll run the 800. So I started off as an 800 meter runner, and I ran like 211. Had the record in my San Diego area. And then every year somebody would suggest that I try a different event. Tried a different event and got to the 100 and the hurdles and I was like, okay, here. I like that. Only 105 meters. I'm good. And, uh, you know, then I set goals for myself of wanting to go to the Olympic Games. And I didn't know if that was true or not. You know, I didn't, uh, you know, by the time I got to college, um, Bob Kersey was the coach there. And I remember meeting him and him telling me, you know what? You're a diamond in the rough. Really rough, but you're a diamond in the rough. I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to be chiseling for a while. But, uh, and he told me what he thought I could do. And now me, I always tell people I should be from Missouri because I'm definitely, I should be from the show me state because I'm skeptical of everything. And I was like, nah, that's what a coach is supposed to tell you. They're supposed to like build you up and give you all these little pipe dreams, you know. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to flip the script on this man. I'm going to do everything he tells me to do. And if it don't work out, I'm going to say, uh-huh, now what? And, uh, and I plugged in. I plugged in and I did everything that I was supposed to do and things just started happening. You know, my time started dropping. And I, you know, started believing like, okay, maybe this can happen, you know. And, and little by little started changing my goals. And um, then 88... Well, 80, yeah, 88, I broke the American record in college, in the, and that was the first time a collegiate had broken the 100-meter hurdle record. So I was primed to do very well, and then I always tell people the bottom fell out. Um, I started, you know, having issues. I mean, I was pulling hamstrings. I couldn't remember stuff. My hair was falling off. My nails were breaking, and these are real. These are not Lee press -ons. These are Gail's nails. And something was wrong. You know, I, I tell people I made it on the on the team in 88 by the grace of God. I mean, I was in Florence's world record race, and I was feeling terrible, you know. And so, and every day it was getting worse and worse. Got to the Olympic Games and ran slower than I'd ever run. Came back, started going to the doctor. The doctor was telling me there's nothing wrong. I'm like, it's got to be something wrong because I'm very detailed in my goal setting, and it's not working out. And I... um. It took two and a half years, like I said, that three years. My coaches, my family, they didn't know what was going on, you know. They, like everybody else, thought I was crazy for a while, too, you know. And I felt like I was crazy. I covered up all my mirrors. I couldn't stand the way I looked. My face was breaking out. You know, my eyes were bulging out. Uh, had a goiter, didn't know it at the time. Once I found out, I was mad at everybody who knew me. I'm like, you guys let me walk around with this big sack on my neck, and then I start wearing turtlenecks. Um, and so... But I will say, even though they didn't understand what I was going through, they were there for me. You know, I was losing a lot of weight. At my worst, I was under, and I, and I don't know exactly how much weight I lost because I stopped getting on the scale. One scale said 79, one said 82. That's a lot of weight to lose. My running weight was supposed to be between 120, 125, and when I first started losing weight, Bobby would be like, look, every time I see you, you better have some stick-to-your-ribs food. I mean, like... Peanut butter and jelly. I'm like, I don't eat peanut butter and jelly, Bobby. I don't eat stuff that, I, that's a contrast to your taste palate. All peanut butter or all jelly. He said, well, whatever, but you better have it. He'd make me come over to his house, 
fixing like steak dinners and, I, and so he knew you know mashed potatoes everything that's supposed to like you know beef you up and I'm still losing weight my heart rate was like crazy that I mean I don't know why I was laying under his desk but he was like I guess it was a quiet spot I don't know but um you know take my heart rate and it's like 140 160 I do anything and shoot up to 180 crazy stuff and um he was like you gotta you can't do anything you know kicked off the track I actually gave a resignation letter to Bobby because I, I felt like you know all the great athletes he's got out here you know Valerie Briscoe, Greg Foster, Jeanette Bold and Andre Phillips um, everybody you know Florence was still out there and I felt like I was wasting his time you know maybe I need to, to reevaluate what I thought you know I always said I wanted to be a teacher and I was like maybe this is my time to go and do that and he tore up my resignation letter. He said, I don't know what we're going, what you're going through, but we're going to figure it out together. You know, and the same thing with my family. They were, they, you know, they would ask me, uh, how do you feel? What's, I'm, I don't know. I, I don't feel like me. You know, this whole time I just wanted to catch up to me. Catch up to the old Gale Devers. The old Gale Devers left this track world at a 12.61. I, I was pulling my hamstrings jogging. And so the support... It's big. Like you said, you may not see it, but to these athletes, if they don't have somebody to lean on, if they and, and a support team is not just your coach. It is. It's your coach. It's your therapist. It might be your nutritionist. It might be somebody that you talk to. It might just be somebody that hangs out with you that has nothing to do with track. You know, I had friends that didn't know nothing about track and field, but it was cool to be able to have that outlet. Because otherwise, as an athlete, you're always thinking. And if there's a major championship coming up, that's what you think about almost 24-7. You know, so I was a big, I, I like solitaire. You know, I like doing jigsaw puzzles. I like, you know, um, crocheting and reading, and reading books. So that was like my outlet. But there's always that behind the scenes hero, heroine um, or shero, you know, depending on who they are that if we as athletes did not have that, we wouldn't make it. You really wouldn't because they keep us sane. You know, through injury, you got your therapist. You know, track and field is so mental. Uh, you know, you can have all the potential in the world, but if your mind is not there, potential goes to the grave with you, if you think about it. You know, you, you, you got to believe. Regardless of what other people are telling you you can do, if you don't believe it, it won't happen. You know, you get to a big stage like this. It's the World Championships. Thank goodness it's in, and, and I, I, I'm appreciative that we're having these World Championships after the world has kind of opened back up, and let's hope it stays open, in what I call Track Town, or what, what is called and referred to as Track Town USA, because this was the support also from your fans. I, every year when I started my competition, I started right here at Prefontaine. People would go to Europe, and they would run, and they were like, you know, I was uh, invited to run and meet. So I'm like, can't do it. I don't open up until whenever Prefontaine is. I know I have a lane. And the reason for that was because of the fans. If I was coming, I remember one year coming, I was bandaged because I was like, oh, gosh, I got to get out there and run because I think it was maybe a world championship year. But I was coming off of an injury, and I was like, okay, I got to run. Just take me up and let me go. And I remember, and these fans are so in tune and knowledgeable about the athletes. Not just the American athletes, they know about track. So when I got there and I had, you know, Prefontaine, you got the, the best of the best coming here. And I had that in that competition. And I remember we used to walk out and it was like a, like a 220 meters walk out before you get to the start line and from the time I walked out you know they saw you know they were giving me encouragement they were like it's okay girl you got this you could just go out there you know and that hypes you up you got 220 meters of somebody pumping you up like there you are like your hype man you know so by the time I got there I felt like I was like I could do this injury or no injury I'm going for it and I did and I ended up running the fastest time in the world at that point and so you talk about support, you talk about fans. Yeah, it was great last year in Tokyo. The competition was great. There was nobody in the stands. But look at this. And look how these athletes are rising to the occasion, you know, being here. And it means the world.
it, it really means the world, and, and that's what track and field is about. So everybody plays their part. It's what I call it's a relay. It really is a relay, and it depends on what your what your what your leg is on the relay. Media, you know. And I will say, being on this side of the camera, oh Lord, it's a whole different ball game. You know, as athletes, we are. You know, we plan. Like for me, I planned what time I was coming into the stadium. In my warm up, I got bathroom time. I got signing autograph time. You know, my fans were always cool that they knew I was signing, and then they gave me time. I was like, okay, now I gotta go warm up and, and get ready. They're like, okay, we'll see you on the track. But you never pay attention to all that's going on and what it actually takes to get this. You know, when I came back from my Graves' disease in 91, my whole goal was, because it was in Tokyo, I wanted my friends and my fans, all that had supported me throughout my Graves' disease and coming back, to be able to watch me. And then I realized, uh-oh, they've never shown a women's 100-meter hurdle final in the States because not an American had ever made it. That became my new goal on my sticky note. I was like, I gotta get there. I, I don't know how, but I gotta get there. I gotta figure this out. I'm gonna have to study these ladies and and make my strategy and my game plan, but I'm willing to switch it if I have to on the dime. You know, if I gotta throw an audible, I'm throwing an audible to get to that final. And I did. And I ended up coming in second place. I ran 12.63, so I was almost catching back up to Gail. And everybody went home. Bobby let everybody go on vacation. I was like, I got to go back. I got to go to Europe because I can't be done. And I ended up ending at 12.48 that, that year. And uh, But we don't know what goes on with all this. You know, we don't even see all this stuff. So it's like, oh, my goodness. So, you know thousands and thousands of people and what it takes everybody has a duty you know it's like making a car everybody has a, a, a part and when we put it together it becomes a, a well-tuned engine and it works you turn the engine on and it comes on or I guess these days electric you know everybody has their uh, their electrical system and you turn it on you don't hear a thing because it's smooth sailing <laughs> and just two more questions you um um, do you feel, so you were talking about like you work with, you know, a lot of athletes now and, you know, supporting them. Do you feel, and also like mental health, do you feel that um, athletes, um, in terms of the support that they get and in terms of dealing with their mental health, um, there's been improvement since you've competed to what we see now? It's been improvement, but we can still do much better. Because if we were done, we wouldn't hear about it. So if people are still struggling, and it's for athletes to understand that it's okay to say I need help. It's okay to say I'm in a dark spot. You know, I know, like I said, I was in my grave disease. I was in a dark spot. You got to be willing to reach out and ask for that help and that support. There has to be a shoulder to lean on. In addition to that, we got all these young athletes that we just throw them out and just start them. They don't know what to do with that. Where are the mentors? You know, this is why I wanted to come back to my sport to figure out how can I lend a hand? How can I be there? I try to reach out to all my hurdlers, you know, that are competing. Give them, you know, let them know, I'm, I got you. I know what it's like. You know, you keep the belief regardless of where you are. If you did it once, you can do it again. You know, I always tell people, I don't care if I'm 95 years old and I see Jackie on the court or I see uh, Evelyn Ashford or Merlene Audie, I'm going to be concerned, okay, because I know they're not going to step out unless they're ready. You know, and so th that's what it's about. we got to be supportive and help, you know. That's like my goal with Graves' disease. If two million, I'm just making up numbers, if two million Americans have it, that means one million is going to get thyroid eye disease. I can't stop until everybody knows it. If we say there's 500,000 who have mental health issues, we got to do something until that number says zero, or at least until that number says that those who have it know about it and they're getting treatment. Love that, love that. So just two other questions. You did, um, mainly in your professional career, you did the 100 and the 100 meter hurdles. Did you have a preference of event? <laughs> I didn't have a preference, but do you know who my coach was? <laughs> Bob Kersey makes you run whatever. I mean, I remember running 400. He told Jackie and I one time, we were at practice. He's like, well, you guys better get ready because you got to come through and practice like a 52. I'm like, I was like, okay, we're going to have to focus. 
we, we walked away and it, it was like practice was like uh, like a track meet. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take off anything that I can take off because I got to get here. And then we ran and he was like, okay, you guys are running the relay at Prefontaine. I'm like, what? I should have ran slow. I was like, but um, um, in college, I ran both relays, long jump, triple jump, 100 meters, 100 meter hurdles. Um, I did not do the multis. Uh, that was Jackie. That was not me. Um, but no, 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 no. I was out there messing around with her just because I was out there would be with her at practice or whatever. But no, I mean, I have done a half marathon since then, but um, everything. But, you know, it was always a challenge for me, and I didn't have a problem being the first event to start, the last event to finish, so I had to sit down and had to warm up one time. So I was good with that. But um, I enjoyed doing a lot. You know, it taught me you know, a lot about myself, you know, um, even though the hundred, and I'll even tell you, the hurdles was supposed to be my specialty, but for me to work on my speed, I hopped in the hundred, and people are like, you're not a hundred meter runner, you're a hurdler, but like, okay, t that's why I always tell people it's not what people believe, it's what you believe, because okay, tell me, tell me that back in 92 and 96 when I was the one with the gold medal, you know, so it is what it is. <laughs> and then, um, do you have, so let's say you said you've done all these different events, but do you have an event that you've never done before that you would love to jump into? If you had the chance, you were healthy and you're prime, that you would love to try? Um, no. <laughs> Maybe as I got older, um, it would have been interesting to see what I could have done in an 800. Because um, in high school, I mean, I ran it that one year. We didn't have coaches that were like, you know, it was high school, um, and I ran 211. And even when I ran it, we were rushing to get there, so it was a half warm-up. And I was like, okay, 211. So, and then when I ran the half, like everybody's like, okay, Gail, you're a sprinter. You're going to have a tendency to go out fast, and this is a very hilly course, so wait. So I ran waiting, waiting, and I was like, well, what am I, what am I waiting for, and when am I supposed to be moving? And I remember coming around and I heard the guy, Rich Kana, who used to run, and he's in charge of Atlanta Track Club. He's like, let's go, Gail, finish strong. So I knew I was 400 meters from the finish. I was so mad. I was like, oh my goodness, I just wasted. I didn't know where to move. I'm like, I, I guess I was like zoned out and I was just running like, cause they were like, oh, you can't wear, you know, when I started training, I trained for three months for this, for the half marathon. And I was like, oh, I'll get to wear my music. They were like, no, because you want to be aware of your surroundings. You're on the street. So I never wore, so I learned to zone out and just like in my head singing a song or whatever. So I zoned out so much that I didn't even know where I was supposed to pick it up. I was so mad. I recovered from a half marathon. My heart rate got right back down to 43. I was like, this is ridiculous. And everybody's like, well, that means you need to do another one. I said, no, that means it wasn't on my bucket list and now it's already checked off. So that's okay. You know, so I, I think it would have been interesting to be coached to run an 800 and see what I actually could have done. <laughs> this is a very full circle. You said you started off in cross country, got to, <laughs> got to the half marathon. Yeah. Ah. yeah. So, and I, you know, I usually I have on boots because the kids are like, Coach Gail, for real. I'm like, it's not the shoes, it's what's in the shoes. You know, and I'm demonstrating going over hurdles or whatever. But it's fun because I feel like I'm helping that next generation, even if it's not to come to the World Championships or Olympic Games, helping them to figure out themselves. You know, I also, I'm on, like, the board for flag football for girls, and that's to access an opportunity for some girls that they never thought. You know, right now there's, like, 15, 16 NAIA schools. I hope to get in the SEC and some Division One schools to give scholarships. I know my own daughter. That's what she would pick. She was like, you guys crazy for running. Uh, I'm playing football, you know. So I just want to be there and, and, and be a part of that next generation and play my part. You know, like those who came before me, whose shoulders that I stand on, I want to be that for someone else. Real quick, I'm sorry, I just have to ask, because of course you mentioned uh, Wilma Rudolph and she's an absolute legend and you know, just thinking of, you know, you mentioning the, uh, the people came before you, who are some of your role models that you looked up to, either in track or even outside? Um, in track and field, Wilma Rudolph, Wyoming Atias, you know, and I was so glad that I was able to give Wilma her uh, award in 1993, it was called The Great Ones, with Muhammad Ali and Kareem. Uh, myself and Coach Temple gave her that award. And that was a big honor. And, and I remember her giving me words of encouragement even before that at the 91 World Championship saying, you know, I was watching you and I've been watching you go out there and do. And I think because she extended herself to me is one of the reasons why I try to extend myself to other people. And then Wyoming Atias, you know, nobody knew. 
you know, that she had won in 64 and 68. And I remember at that, sitting there saying, you know, I'm going to get my name in the record books next to you. And I was actually playing what I said, and then I went home, and I was like, okay, you know, because she was like, you should. And so at that time, I was only the second person to do it behind her. It was she and I. And we stay in contact. You know, she got a birthday coming up. Um, you know, my girls love her. When they were little bitty ones, she taught them this little song. And so it's, you know, just reaching out to all of those who came before. I remember um, 2012 or one of those years we were here and like Milk Campbell, like all the great ones, you know, Rafer, when all of them were, and I still have that picture when we were there and we had gone out to a, a function um, just to be there and just to tell them thank you. And I'm so glad that I had the opportunity before they passed on, because a lot of them are not here now, to tell them how much they mean to me and how thankful. You think about what they had to do. People talk about the village and the this and that. They had to come across on a boat, you know, and if you're seasick and you've never been that way, you know, and then they still had to compete. And they had to compete in a time where they weren't wanted. Nobody wanted them. You talk about the 1960 Olympic Games, you know, with Jesse Owens and all that they had to deal with, you know, criticized, talked about, and yet they still come out and they compete and give it their all. You know, you talk about John Carlos, you know, and, and, and Tommy. They weren't given their just due, you know. They were criticized for what they did, you know. Nobody understands. If you go back and you look, Wyoming had on black shorts. She was the first one. She ran before they ran. She had on black shorts, and that was her way of protesting, you know, uh, of what she thought was not right. What she thought was not right. So she had on black shorts, and she did her little dance, you know. But that was a way, and nobody knows that. Nobody even talks about that. You know, I always thought that she was somebody who did not get her. Do you know how hard it is? And yes, I do know. So that's why I commend Shelly Ann for what she's done. How hard was it back then, 64 and 68, to repeat as 100-meter champion? And people act like they don't know that. These kids don't know their history. You got to know your history. You know, now in this instance, knowing your history helps you repeat your history because you know the good, the bad, the ugly. And so that's why I hold her in high esteem at all times for what she's done for our sport, what she's done for me, the impact she's had on my kids, the friendship that I have with her, you know, my friendship with Bobby and Jackie. You know, they call Bobby Uncle Bobby and, and Auntie Jackie. And I remember they had, uh, it was probably 2012 too, and I was doing something at a function. I was speaking, it was like a restaurant, and I hear all this noise, like, blam, 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 blam. I'm like, what in the world? You know, I was trying to be, ah, it's Bobby in there messing with my kids. So loud, like Uncle Bobby, you know, but that's, that's we're family, you know, and that's how it's supposed to be. Um, you know, everybody moves on, you get older, you do your own thing, but it's just like with kids. You grow up in a family, you go and you're off on your own now because you think you're grown, but you're still family, you can still come home always. Hail Divers, you have been, you dropped so many gems here and you've been so impactful and so influential, you know, to the world of track and field. And I feel like to many people who are not even in track and field. So I thank you. Thank you for including me and thank you for what you do because, you know, it's about giving the word, passing that word, passing information about people. So you're on the relay too and what you're handing out is knowledge. So I appreciate you for what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you.